going to look at essays and reports, asking what they are, what the differences are between them. Essays first then. This is a little bit of the etymology of the word. I'm using one of those Google cards that you get when you type define into a Google search engine and then the word that you're interested in. So I type define full colon essay and I got back this card and it shows me that the current word essay goes back to the late 15th century and it means something like test the quality of but it relates to this, these other ideas here. So this, uh, in English, an assay office was a place where you took your gold or your silver to have its um, percentage of gold and silver determined. You know, measure the amount of gold in my gold ring, as it were. Uh, a CE in Old French has a very similar meaning. It, it's, that's to do with minerals again. And this one here, so that's, um, that's trial in the legal sense. But you can think of that as, you know, a legal trial tests the quality of the evidence that supports the claim being brought by, say, the prosecuting counsel. So that's, we can see from this that there's an idea connected with testing or trying, but it's also got a connection with weighing and measuring too. So essays typically collect ideas, theories, and research evidence that have been put forward by other people. And we might do this for a number of different purposes. For example, to compare and contrast one with another. So if we have, say, two competing theories for something, we might compare and contrast those theories in an essay by looking at how well they respond to the research uh, and what ideas they give us about which ones we're going to prefer for which purposes. We could use um, uh, an essay to, to try and draw out support and illustration of, of a theory by an idea and, and by the research evidence. So an, an example here would be the ways in which we can theorise and explain the idea of recurring patterns of domestic violence. So we can use evolutionary psychology theories to explain why it is that victims of domestic violence appear to find uh, perpetrators of violence attractive. And so we, we might look to things like, well, the physical characteristics that make the, the perpetrators of violence attractive are also the physical characteristics that make them successful perpetrators of violence. So big muscles and square jaw and stuff like that are indicators, according to evolutionary psychology, are indicators of um, Better, better chances of survival, stronger genes as it were, but they are also indicators that the person has the physical capacity to dominate others. Uh, we could look for um, gaps or lacunae. Lacunae is just the fancy word for gap there. To, so bits in our understanding that are just missing. So if we were thinking about um, the classic uh, explanation of short-term memory put forward by Atkinson and Schifrin, they suggested that uh, short-term memory was encoded entirely acoustically, but that doesn't explain how it is that we appear to have short-term memory storage for visual objects without representing them by words. Um, so there's a gap there in our understanding of our theory. We could use an essay to explore that, so we could look at the research evidence that shows that there are iconic visual memories in short-term storage, and then say, well, how does that, why is it the theory doesn't have that idea in it? And maybe use that to develop a new idea about what sort of a theory you would need uh, and point towards something like Badley and Hitch with the two modes of short-term storage that we find in the working memory model. We can also use an essay to identify contradictions or incoherence in the way something is understood. An example of this would be Skinner's rather famous account of aversion. You know, people... People become averse to stimuli because they have negative associations with them. So if you encounter something, it's painful or uncomfortable or distressing for you, so you don't go near it again. Well, there's an contradiction, there's an incoherence there in that people very often engage in, repeatedly engage in behaviours that result in negative experiences. I mean, people drink too much beer and they wind up with hangovers. They know the hangovers in the post and yet they drink the beer. So there's, a, there's an incoherence or an inconsistency or contradiction in a purely Skinnerian account of behaviour. So those are essays. I, you know, there's a bunch of other purposes you could put an essay to. I'm sure you can think of others. This is no means an exhaustive list. What I'm trying to suggest here, though, is that this, an essay, is something that happens on the page in front of you. It's done in front of you at the point at which you read it. So it's a present tense activity. It is a trial. You're trying something out in front of the reader right there and then. And that is what distinguishes the essay from the report. Reports like newspapers, they, they tell us about something after it's happened. We did something and we then report on it to the reader. 
And when we report, we, we, there's, there are a set of conventions, structural conventions that we normally follow. So we have an abstract, and that's a bit like the blurb that you find on the back of a book. It tells you something about what the book's got in it. It doesn't give, you know, you don't write the whole book on the back of it, but you try and give a, a quick, brief outline. It's like a professional courtesy that researchers show one another in producing research reports with an abstract, you make it easy for the person who's conducting other research to work out whether or not they need to read yours. So let's say I'm conducting research in a particular field and, and my keyword search of the database of journal articles produces 50 or 60 results. I, I identify that I can actually get my hands on 25 of them. Do I need to read all 25? Well, I certainly need to read the blurby abstract bit of all 25 to work out which ones I can safely set aside. That's not saying they're rubbish or bad, it's just maybe they're not as relevant as I initially thought they were. Once I've got an abstract, uh, just a word about sequencing actually, <laughs> you, you may put your abstract, you do put your abstract at the front of your report, but don't write it until after the whole report is written. Um, otherwise, you, you wind up trying to write to an abstract, which is it's just not a good idea. If you try to write to an abstract, you'll wind up writing something very distorted and twisted. So. Your introduction describes the purpose and explains why it's necessary to conduct the, the, the task that you're reporting on. What, what were you doing and why? So, um, a, a good thing to do in an, an introduction is to set out what your objective is. And if you can set it out as a question where you can imagine what sort of thing would be an answer. So, let's say that I'm conducting um, a survey or a, a, an audit of community-based assets in a local area for, uh, let's say, for the, the support of the development of under three-year-olds. You know, I'm looking at a local community and saying, what assets are present in this community to help under three-year-olds live the best lives they possibly could? Um, so I'm, I'm going to do an, an asset-based community development type audit. So I just say that's what I'm going to do. You know, well, my question is, are there resources to... Now, there's a yes-no answer to that. Yes, there are, or no, there aren't. Obviously, I won't just say yes or no in my conclusion. I'll say yes, but, or yes, and. So I might say yes, but there aren't very many of them, or yes, but they're only available to a certain section of the community, or yes, and there's plenty of them for all sorts of different sections of the community. So the, whilst I might have a, a very clear, very precise question, I don't want something so trite and simplistic that it's not worth doing. You know, nobody's going to write a report on, you know, the research I did to determine whether you wanted a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. You know, that, that's a yes-no answer, or, you know, or one or the other alternate answers. But it's not going to be something that requires a great deal of interpretation and analysis. Okay, once I've worked out, once I've set out what my objective is, it's also important that I show that I've thought about or explored what other people have done in a related field. So if I'm talking about a particular local community, the likelihood that there'll be a, a preceding asset audit might be quite low. But I might well look at asset auditing in other comparable communities, you know, so I might go to the, the community-based assets uh, website and see what kind of audits they've got to show me how the job could be done, um, what kind of methods I might consider, uh, the reasons why I might consider those methods, and so, so forth. If we're thinking about um, the scale of the literature review, it's got to be fit to the purpose. So if you're producing a report on a field exercise that's got a shelf life of a couple of years, you're not going to spend a lot of time reviewing the literature because that would be a waste of time. So the scale would be quite small. You might even only look at five or six relevant pieces of research. If we're thinking about something much more substantial with a, a longer purchase, you know, something that's going to hold true for a longer period of time, then we would obviously we would need to inform that with a better overview of the relevant literature. Now I haven't included anything about method and methodology here because I'm imagining um, a, a very basic, very simple report where your method and your methodology would come from these two things here. So your introduction would say what you're going to do and your literature review would show why you chose to do, you know, why you chose those methods. But you could, if we were thinking about a larger scale report, have a separate methods and methodology section. Or if we were thinking about an experimental report, we would normally have a clear description of method. So um, 
once we've got that idea down, we're going to go to the report on the results and findings. What did we actually learn from that exercise? And these findings might be expressed in terms of diagrams and charts. And as we can see here, it's little, what I call these trend lines and things. But it could also be in terms of just simply summary statements. So let's imagine that we conducted that community-based asset um, audit and we, we found out stuff by conducting interviews and question, focus groups. Yeah, that's it. Gone and found a local parents group and said, oh, well, let's talk to them about what assets they, they feel are available to help their children develop and are they useful, are they valuable, are they accessible, blah, blah. And then I'm going to interview local service providers and ask them similar related questions. Well, it, the focus group and the interviews will have specific results and they'll need to be somewhere ideally they would be appended to the report certainly don't put the raw data you know the raw transcript of your discussion with these people in your results section nobody wants to have to wade through all of that raw material your job will be to select and choose and clarify little bits out of that so you might well do the kind of classic almost sort of like a a content analysis of interview data so you've got a lot of qualitative, semi-structured interview data, which you look back over your notes from, and you see, oh, this professional said that, this professional said that, there's a common theme there in what they're saying, and lo and behold, the parents group said something on the same theme as well. And so you can say, well, these themes emerged from the qualitative data in the interviews and focus groups, and that's what would be the result. If we'd got a more quantitative thing, clearly you're going to have a table or some kind of summarizing statistic for it. So let's say um, I, I conducted a large-scale questionnaire survey of the parents in the local community and got somehow managed to get a very high response rate, you know, one thing or another. I'd got, you know, 60% of parents saying that this resource was the most valuable one and that it was most accessible, and 30% said something different. I'd have those percentages and ranges of variation and stuff like that in my results. Having done that, I'd have to move to a kind of a discussion. And the discussion is going to be like the most important bit, I think, of the report, because what it's doing is it's trying to establish the connection between the objectives, the questions that we set ourselves in our introduction, and the data that we found. So does this stuff allow us to answer these questions? So here we're going to discuss what we found out, and we're going to go back and, and look and see how does it connect to the questions that we actually asked. And at this point, you even find people will be saying things like, well, having conducted my research, I now realise that the, the questions that I asked in my questionnaire didn't actually provide me data that would respond to my original research objective. You know, maybe I was asking the wrong group of people, or I asked a dumb question rather than a smart one or something like that. But you don't put, don't go for that completely here. That, that goes into your recommendations, really. So you have a discussion that tests whether or not this data supports or answers or helps us clarify our thinking about the objective and once we've done that we make recommendations now the recommendations could be about the objective you know so if i'm thinking about the asset-based community development thing i'm saying well what we need to do on the basis of the data i've collected is we need to open uh, another uh, play group in this part of the, the local community so you know that's what's needed or it could be that I'm making recommendations about future research because I haven't found out enough to answer the questions or the questions that I asked were, were the wrong questions to ask. So the recommendations follow on from the discussion. And then finally, we move to a conclusion which summarises the report and revisits the aims and objectives, suggesting answers or responses to them. And this is the thing, you remember I said at the beginning, essays and reports, what's the differences? Well, this is the thing that's the same. Both an essay and a report should do the same thing. They should try and draw a conclusion. And I've got another screencast in mind about conclusions. We're both going the same direction here. You know, a conclusion tells us something about what we what we did, um, and why we did it, and whether or not the, the data that we've collected supports and answers that question. Certainly the thing I want to avoid is the idea of a conclusion like, like this the cartoon character here suggesting. We don't want our conclusions to merely be the place where we got tired of thinking. They should, they should summarise what we're doing and they should explain how the data that we've collected responds to the objectives of our original task.